more good morning everyone um yes i uh you may completely forget what i was supposed to be talking about but um we kind of coming out of um some teaching that steve did talking about uh making a 180 turn and turning away from sin and um i followed up with just talking about um uh, repentance what it was to turn and to the two two parts of it are to kind of name sin agree with god about it he knows about it already to agree with it and then to wait and ask for forgiveness to take the time really to ask for that blessing so um and then we talked again last time about receiving forgiveness ourselves and and beginning to um understand forgiving others and uh i had it in my mind that i was also going to continue to talk about generational sin things that come down to us and patterns that we see but um you know i i really had a hesitation this week when i was looking at um a scripture that jesus told about the woman coming to the pharisee's house and just the overwhelming fullness of the forgiveness that she experienced there i thought it would be good for us to sit with that to really appreciate the words chris just said that the the this is really the place of the gospel and so um that then after today we might be in a frame of mind that whatever the Holy Spirit brings up, we know it's just an easy matter for him to relieve us. And it's not something we have to dig around for our own sin or sins we, you know, that have been committed against us that we want to, uh, to let go. So anyway, that's just a preamble. And um, I asked uh, Marianne if she would read this passage for us. It's Luke 7. Uh, I think 36 to 36 to 50, if you want to look at it, but you don't need to. And um, Marianne, are you there? She's not with us. She's left her room. We'll wait for a moment. Well, maybe I'll pray just to begin. Lord, we thank you for this time together to <clears throat> consider what you've done for us and your mercy, your everlasting mercy. And I'm praying from Psalm 51, have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, you desire truth in the heart, in the inward being. So teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Fill me with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you've broken rejoice, and hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Lord, we thank you so much that this is our prayer to you, and yet it's the word of God to us. That your desire is to uh, have us hear your call to come close to you. To come to you as we would to a dear elder brother, which you are, and to have us... Uh, forgiven, blessed, and ready to join you in ministry to 
heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. And Lord, if there's anything in us today that you would speak to us about, we pray for that as we listen to your word and consider it. And we bless you. Be with us, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come upon us. And we give thanks, just remembering Irina May's mention last week. So briefly she mentioned this, but it was so beautiful that you, Holy Spirit, were near to her. And she received that truth. And we receive it with her and rejoice with her. Bless us this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Marianne, did you come back? This girl is gone. Should we phone her? Or sh- I'm really sorry that she misses, misses this because I know she's prepared to read. Um, Mary Charlotte, do you want someone else to read? Well, it isn't that. I just, I'm just wanting um, Marianne to read, but I guess we can, we can go. Yeah. Bernice, do you want to read? Sure. Okay. So that was uh, Luke 7.36. Yeah. Okay. I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible. Um, 36, hang on. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting requesting Jesus to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head, kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him and that she is a sinner. Jesus, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, I been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Um, Great. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this, but um, I'm just going to go through the scripture a little bit. Um, This is, you know, this is the question, who can forgive sins? Because, of course, it was known that only God forgave sins. And there was a great deal of shedding of blood. As it says in Hebrews, there's no forgiving forgiveness of sins without shedding of blood. So the sacrificial system that was set up in the temple was a huge bloodbath so for someone to come who obviously did things that were of god healing teaching with wisdom that nobody understood how jesus would have gotten even at the age of 12 when he was in the temple 
explaining things to the um, teachers and older rabbis, teachers, um, it was astonishing. And so it couldn't just be ignored that he said, your sins are forgiven. So here's a beautiful example of it. And, you know, this is a, I, this reminds me of a picture that I saw. I might have, I hope I haven't said this to many people, but I, I visited some friends in Montreal a few years ago, about three years ago. And they're a Jewish couple. She's originally from Iraq. He's from Iran. And on their wall was a picture I'd never seen um, of the marriage of their grandparents, uh, her grandparents in Iraq in Babylon and um, it was a beautiful party in the middle but at the you know and I, it looked like there were just bushes along the side it was a garden wedding and it looked so beautiful all the guests in the middle and the hoopah at the front where the wedding was and um, it just looked like black bushes at the side but when when they noted for me, the black bushes were actually Muslim women in black covered, and they had come to enjoy that celebration too. So I think of this in this scripture that it seems odd to us to go into a dinner, but this was common in the Middle East that people could see what was going on, could maybe, wow, look at the food, or if there was entertainment, I think of Salome's dancing or for Herod or you know, a speaker or somebody talking or an argument, people could, could be part of it. So this woman, you know, she has figured some, Jesus is there. She heard he was there at dinner. And she, I mean, we're given so little detail. And I'm going to make some detail here. You think about it yourself and check it out. But you know, she'd obviously heard of him. And the implication, the woman from the city, is that this is a woman, a prostitute. Definitely somebody familiar with worldly things, making a living on the, you know, knowing people on the street. And if you've known anybody like that or been on the street at all, you know, there are things, it's another world. You know, you, you hear the news quickly. And so she knew, she found out, she knew where he was. She knew that house. She knew probably the men there, some of them. She would know that, she would know a lot. Also, she, she may have heard him because she did know what was going on. If this is still in Nain, I didn't find out all the towns where Jesus spoke, but she could have been in a group hearing him before she could have begun to realize this, this was significant. She could have seen the woman with the issue of blood healed or heard of the demoniac or seen him. Um, you know, she could have known about the paralytic. It, you know, word spreads quickly and in, um, in a rural type of community where you're on the street so she heard this, and the next thing it says is, and that he was reclining. I like your translation because mine's sitting. And I've done a nice drawing from you of reclining men you'll enjoy. Um, that she made tracks there, and she got, she managed to get an alabaster jar filled with ointment that she had to take. This was her main objective, understanding that she was probably going to anoint his head with oil, with ointment. Now in the commentaries that talk about the other um, anointings where, where uh, Mary went and where um, the other woman, there, there are four accounts in the gospels. It's said that that much ointment or nard, you know, heavy, beautiful perfume, you know how it is if you get some at the bay sometimes as a sample, it's very expensive. And even these alabaster jars were alabaster mined in India to hold it, a very precious thing, estimated at a year's wages. So our average wage in Canada is $40,000. 
you know, I just want you to think for a moment if you've ever seen anybody give somebody that they don't know or that isn't, it isn't an inheritance, $40,000, something worth that. And of course, in the other accounts, the disciples go crazy. Judas says this is terrible to give this much. It could have done so much in the community. And uh, Jesus said no. And in, in that case, it was definitely anoint, anointing for his burial. So a real awareness of who he was. But here it's the same. Yeah, I don't think any of us know that. If you know it, we want to hear about it in the break. Um, so she is coming to do that. And I want to point out that in John, you know, it's one, where the people after one of the feeding of the, of the 4,000 asked Jesus, well, what are we to do to do the work of God? What do we do? And he said, believe the one whom he has sent. That is the work of God. So from the beginning of this passage, when she heard this, we become aware as the reader of Jesus' account that she's doing the will of God. She doesn't have to do anything. She doesn't have to confess. She's coming in the will and purposes of God. She is already his sister because he says before, Listen, my mother and my brothers, let them stay there. I'm busy right now. My mother and my brothers and my sisters are the ones who do the will of God, who obey the will of God. And so she is already, in a sense, in those first moments, established for us as an obedient servant of God because she believes. And who knows the sins she's carrying to him? You know, I always think of Judas. If Judas hadn't gone to the chief priests and thrown down the money and tried to get absolution from them, if he had gone to Christ, could he have had a different outcome? I know he was ordained to do it, but do you know what I mean? If, that, if he had done that, would the story have been different? We have to know where to go with sin. And when we go there, it's just an incredible thing. She is, uh, in some way, I'm, I'm suggesting this to you. She is sorting out her sin because, she, because he said your sins are forgiven. This was important to her. And I'm also suggesting that, you know, I'm trying to break down repentance and confess and receive forgiveness. And then you forgive others and you do it this way. And we think sometimes in the Lord's prayer, it's a transaction. Forgive me as I forgive others. Do I have to give them first? Forgive them first. But really... <laughs> God's activity in us is first, I believe. It's his, his action causes our action. When we're forgiven, we, we get the drift and we know how to forgive. Sometimes when a person's converted, things lift and they don't even realize until they go to be hateful in a certain way that it isn't there anymore. So I'm suggesting here that she comes, you know, I mean, it comes bursting out of her in tears. She comes with a package here of her own sin and you know there if she's doing the work of a prostitute or sex worker as we would say unionized as we would say she has had she, you know there's nothing she hasn't seen for most of us by age something there's not much we haven't understood that is really unhelpful in our lives so she may be coming by this point after hearing him and knowing about him and getting the oil, no, this is going to be for him taking it. She may be thinking of things that have been done to her as a result of what she's done. So she's coming with, I just feel that she's the whole per thing. You know, she is fully aware of Jesus Christ and his identity and fully aware of herself. I always quote, and I don't remember who it was that said a man, a woman, a man is who he is on his knees before God. That's his identity. You know, we want to be so much the Pharisee, religious, big party. We want to be so much, so much for Jesus. And he doesn't want any of it. He just wants knowing who I am and who he is. So she comes and she's, okay, I'm going to show you my picture now. 
I will, I was trying to find a um, picture of, uh, you know, which I found a little one here. I don't know if you can see it. This is a picture of a reclining, I guess that, that it's William Blake's The Last Supper. But here you just see one person reclining. They look like they're asleep. But reclining, often European paintings, this is the Last Supper here, you know, they're at a table. But in the Middle East, they do recline a lot. You know, I was, um, I was, uh, how do I switch this back? Oh, sorry, am I on again? No. Okay, I can't, um, sorry. I, um, you know, the Merbeds, the Assyrian family who came to Gabriel. I was visiting them one day and on their porch was a little mat and I kind of looked at it and um, Eamon, who was about five, he said, that's my father's mat. And he threw himself down and he lay back and he said, see, he lies there like this. He has a cigarette. He has coffee here. And, you know, it, it was just a perfect enactment. And they always ate on the floor on a, on a carpet and you would eat sort of sitting, but then you would sort of slouch. So, um, but as you reclined, um, you also, here I did a painting, I did a picture for you reclining at the table. And so you, you know, the men, you're, you're near the food with, usually they're along the side, but I couldn't draw. They'd be going around sort of like that. And so their faces, they can see each other and they're, um, you know, they can talk and they can grab, this is the food. They can grab the food. Now she, you know, she is probably just standing here at Jesus' foot. She doesn't get further. She doesn't get further because she's overwhelmed and she begins to weep. Now those are tears of, uh, and, and she stays there. It says in the scriptures, she's behind his feet weeping. And she weeps so much that um, his feet are, are wet. You know, I don't know if you've, ever, I, I hate to go on about all these details, but if you've ever seen somebody weeping where it's plopping, a friend of mine said once, and this always stays in my mind that, um, you know, her parents were divorcing and, and the father had left a note. It was really a difficult thing for us as kind of early twenties and, she and her husband went out to a restaurant for dinner. And this is all I remember. She said, you know, he just looked at this, his soup and big plops. It, 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 in my mind, it was like a tap came from his sorrow. And here, it's that kind of thing. You've probably sometimes in children, they're just, you know, big plops of tears. It's so real and heartfelt and this is what happened his feet were wet <laughs> it's hard to imagine eh? has anybody seen that you, I guess your face is wet you can wet something your hair might get a bit wet if you're really bawling but I've never seen that and then she unties her hair and dries his feet which is um, a shocking thing to do you know, no, a shocking thing. Uh, and this is reflected in the Pharisee. It's like, oh my, the guy isn't even a prophet, obviously. And the woman is, this is bad. Like, it's like, it's like he would remove her if he could, but I guess that wouldn't be gracious. So she is just, she never gets to anoint Jesus' face or head. I mean, head, she anoints his feet. She just stays at his feet. And that's also a beautiful thing that we, you know, we talk about being at the foot of the cross or taking things to the foot of the cross. And this is um, pre-echoing being at the foot of the cross and sort of in a really beautiful way, knowing her place, but not that it isn't, it isn't effective. I was thinking to, you know, this, um, just the, the fact that this forgiveness that, that this woman is feeling here, like if she's standing here and weeping on these feet, 
but she's entering where she comes in the presence of Jesus. You know, he's saying the kingdom of heaven is near you. She's entering in a sense, another zone, you know, it's like, it's like we, um, it's like breathing mountain air or even today feeling the cold. You're coming, you come into something in Jesus Christ where we're meant to be living, which is like all bets are off. All rules are upside down. Everything's inverted. The weak is strong. The strong is made weak. The blind see and the ones with sight are blind. This is, this is here's the religious man. And so she knows where she is. This is the thing. She knows where she is. And, you know, it's an amazing thing. And then Jesus, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't speak, right? She doesn't say a word here. Um, uh, she, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and as Jesus was too with Nicodemus, you know, he knows what people are thinking. So as it says here, the Pharisee saw this and was just grossed out. It's like this woman is getting intimate in such a weird way with, with this man who's supposed to be a prophet. Obviously, he's not a prophet because what sort, uh, he would have known the kind of woman she is. And um, it not allowed her to, to touch him because she's a sinner. And um, Jesus answered him. You know, he didn't say anything, but he sees his thought and he answers. Um, and he says, he ta talks about two creditors that, ha that owe two debts. One is um, 500 and one is 50. And the man says, well, which would have, um, which of them love him more? And he says, well, I suppose the one he forgave more. But here it doesn't mean that... Um, he doesn't know that the, the, it isn't that the sin is greater in the woman. It's just that she knows the depth of sin. He does not realize he has any sin. He, he thinks he's gotten rid of it all the time. And this is what a religious person, this is what we can so easily do in the church, is stand, just stand judging other people, just deciding what they're doing and not doing, and be absolutely oblivious to our own relation, deep relationship with God. So he really takes him to town here and instructs, you know, you would think in any other circumstance, he would instruct, we would think we would instruct the person who's doing all these wrong things, we think. But he's instructing this leader here that, um, you know, I came in, there was no servant. That was common to have your feet washed just because it was dusty and everything. And it was a nice way to have dinner then. Um, and uh, you didn't have any water for me. There was no servant. There was nothing. And she used her tears. She, she relieved my feet. She cleaned my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't kiss me. Usually an embrace, a kiss, a greeting. I mean, he is the son of man, the king of the world. And um, she, he didn't do that. He didn't know who he was, really. He was still deciding. He was deciding who Jesus was. And, um, but she didn't stop kissing my feet. He didn't embrace me, my, you know, normally, but she kissed my feet. And you didn't anoint my head with oil, which was very common, but she anointed my feet. So her sins, which are many, his are too, is, are forgiven. And she loves me much. But she understood her sin. And she didn't want any barrier between her and the Lord. And he says to her, your sins are forgiven. And then everybody said, well, who is this that forgives sins? So there are people who are at least asking them the question. We don't know about the Pharisee. We don't hear him again. And then Jesus says, your faith 
has saved you. It's her faith ignited by the Holy Spirit, you know, set in, set, she, it's been revealed to her, but it's built, it's built. And, you know, this reminds me, your faith has saved you. You go in peace. Some commentaries say that. Rabbis said, go in peace when it was a dead body, go in peace to the, to the other world. But uh, that they, to the living, they would say, go into peace. And I like that idea that your faith has saved you. You're going to go in peace with me, actually. She's going to make her life with Jesus Christ. And, you know, recently I heard uh, an account of someone who had had a heart episode. And when they were finished, the doctor said, you know, your heart's perfect. And the person said, well, should I do anything like diet or something like that. you're good to go go your heart is and this reminds me of this we don't know anything about her after this we don't know did she have a discipleship course did she learn da 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 da, da? did she have did she join a women's group what did she do in the community you know we will know one day if we're faithful we meet with her we'll meet we might meet the pharisee Things might have changed with him. We might meet some of these people. If we meet her, we can know. But there's the sense here, she is good to go. We can't even imagine the relationships she had now, the things that changed, the way things were. You know, it's such a beautiful thing. This is, he does all this teaching to the Pharisee, the poor guy. He's got to be humiliated. I hope he was in some small way because she, how much humility did it take for her to come there? I'm sure she was, you know, not even regarded. And he is saying, you are completely, you know, sound spiritually. So it's kind of a beautiful thing, this thing, this story. Um, I wanted just to, I just did this other little thing here. Uh, this is just... This is just, I, I just want to say a few more things about what forgiveness is and what it isn't. But I did make this nice draw, drawing for you again. And this is again going this way. Remember, I made a line and then this was going the opposite, like repenting. When he says go, he is saying, you know, you're going and you're going with God. So he's going to show you what the 180 is and all about it. She doesn't have to fuss about it at all. But I was just thinking here, just trying to draw, draw it, that, you know, you're going along your own way. And you might at different times think, you know, there's a U-turn here. You don't have to keep going or you could do a yield and go up that way. But you just or, you know, somewhere to get you back here on another road. But we keep going and sometimes we hit a brick wall. Or this is a dangerous cliff into the ocean. And when we do that you know something in this woman would have um something registered you know something something happens with us when we say this is not really the way i need to live or this is not the best for me or the most helpful this this isn't working so whatever it is when we get to that place and whatever it was for her where she just it was enough Jesus is always in that. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's a Holy Spirit moment. It's when the Holy Spirit, we say, convicts us of sin. Because it says that in John, that he comes to convict the world of sin. He shows us all the time. And it's a real light bulb moment. And, you know, I think Rena May asked a few weeks ago, said we were talking about repentance. And she said, it sounds kind of um, horrible. Sorry, we made like it was such a great question. It sounds like it's going to be really hard. But you know, once you hear the Lord, and she's getting the ointment, it's an excitement, because you know, you're fully relieved, you are going to be like, she's probably already on the way. But when she encounters and hears his words, which we need to hear too, you are forgiven, go, you are good to go. You're sliding into home plate you know you're you're right there once we hear the lord it's a very short thing to 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 ask forgiveness or to forgive the other it's a short process 
I, I, there was a man called Ed Smith, I think, a ministry called Theophostic, God's Light. And it was a ministry, prayer ministry, very much dealing with lies that we've believed. But he used to say to people he prayed with, um, can you bear to go to this horrible incident or memory of something somebody did for, for like 30 seconds? Because if you'll just go 30 seconds, you'll be relieved for a lifetime. And he would convince the person, yeah, you can think about it for 30 seconds, you know. And it's not a big, it's not, it's, it's a joy. When the Lord speaks to us, it's not, what's the, what's the scripture about? It's not a repentance that brings death. It's a, it's a sorrowful repentance that brings life. You know, it's a, it's a joyful thing. So just to encourage you in that. So uh, I would like to just finish by saying a few things about what forgiveness is and is not. I don't know. Um, is that okay? Are we, I won't be much longer. Any comments or questions so far? These are just a few points to consider. And I just thought maybe if the Lord brings anything, I'm, I'm sort of thinking here more about forgiving others for things that have been committed against us. You know, I was remembering this morning a couple of things. One is I was on a retreat uh, about 25 years ago or something. It was in uh, Calgary. And um, no, 20 years, I guess. And it was a wholeness retreat. Actually, maybe that's where I first met George and Elaine. And it's around that time anyway. And uh, so I was walking with two, two or three people and there was a little, there was a little, um, there was a little rough shack there that they, they called the chapel. Like, I mean, it was rough, you know, and it was in the woods. It didn't look like anybody was in it. It wasn't electrified or anything. And um, so we were walking along, we were talking and I was talking about somebody. I was trying to remember the circumstance. I cannot remember, which is good. I was just talking about how this boss I'd had, had annoyed me in some way. So I thought been unfair, I think it must have been some, it, it was a big story. And I think I had kept it like, do you, do you want to know this, you know, like we were just talking. And my two friends who remain very good friends, uh, Christians, pastors, I, they weren't really amused. I saw they weren't really with me as I was describing the detail of the horrors of this woman or something. I don't remember. I just saw them looking kind of aghast. And they they said, well, have you ever forgiven her? And I thought, and I'm a Christian for a long time at that point. I thought, forgiven her? Are you kidding me? You know, like that was in my head. No, I said. And, they, and we laughed. We did laugh. And they said, well, here's a small chapel. <laughs> And I only remember this because of that building. So I think we, I don't remember anymore. We went in, you know, I can't remember a thing about what that incident was, but they caught me up there. And, you know, we can often have something in our history or even this week that amuses us. We can't believe it. We're outraged. We make it a story and we sort of don't think it's affecting us. But these friends saw immediately this was not helpful for me. This was not helpful at all. And certainly somebody who was trying to encourage other people to be forgiven, and, you know. So that was, that was a sobering, but it was still very gentle and kind. And so this is how the Lord is. So I'm just going to just talk a little bit about a few things to consider about what forgiveness is and what it isn't. So if you have a sin in mind, it's great. If you don't, maybe later you won't. <clears throat> forgiveness first is not a feeling. Um, like we'll have a feeling. Have you ever heard anybody complaining or describing something about somebody and they say, you know, I'm really just, oh, I'm so anxious to forgive them. 
I really want to forgive them so much. It would be such a joy to me to forgive. I've never heard it. I have never heard that. Only when we're going crazy do we want to forgive. Because forgiveness is not a feeling. It is an act of will. Of the will. It's to say, this was a wrong against me. I need to forgive it the way I have wronged God. And, the, and what the person did to us, if it's a sin against us, it is first a sin against God. So you're also, you're acting almost as an advocate for the person because you're beginning a process of releasing them. They may be released to God by that. So to forgive is a decision. Um, it's, uh, and we don't heal. You know, people say time heals. Time does not heal. Who here knows time does not heal? It can amplify, it can deepen, it can make something grow in you. It can encourage and foster bitterness. It can, I don't wanna go on, but it can break our body, our mind, and our spirit is kaputz. You know, it's not with the Lord as fully as we could be. So you don't wait to heal and then you're gonna forgive. Healing, receiving the healing of God allows you to allows healing to be initiated right to to begin so any questions there please reserve them for end feeling feeling is not what we're waiting for it's an act it's a discipline it's like what's that thing about swallow the frogs first when you have to do a chore do the hard part first something i still haven't learned that's what it is we do it um, the second thing is, it's not about, you know, forgive and forget. Like some people say, oh, yeah, you know, I know that I've forgotten all about it. I forget. I forgave it. I let it go. Well, it isn't forgetting it. Actually, forgiving is remembering it. If the Lord brings it to us, like some things, you know, by his grace alone, they're gone. We don't remember. And somebody might say, do you remember I did this to you? Or do you remember I felt so badly? You don't remember it. And that is the grace and mercy of God. But when the Lord brings something to us, we're to remember it. Just like we confess our sin in its detail, we remember this. And it's sometimes very difficult to hear. And we have to hear it from somebody else. You know, this person sinned against you. You need to recognize that. And we recount it. We bring it to the Lord. It's safe to do that. Lord, this was done against me. And I want to recount it and remember, no, this was not good. It was not good. And it hurt me in these ways. And it had these ramifications. So I remember it. It can be something that was done, a sin of commission, it was committed against me, or it can be a sin of omission, something that wasn't done. Uh, of a parent to a child, I was neglected. I, I was never there. I didn't have dental attention. I didn't, you know, whatever it is. I was never encouraged, you know, and sometimes something that is not significant for one person is very significant for another. Sometimes when they come into great encouragement from people, they're like, whoa. This is what other kids had all along. This is very good, you know, and you realize that was lacking. It's okay to say that to the Lord. I forgive that lack. And we were bringing something into the light out of darkness and to see what it is and what it's done. Not to um, get at the other person in any way. We're trying to take the power of the sin off of us, the reproach rolls off of us and uh, so where the sin has lodged in our body our mind our spirit uh, allowed bitterness in um, we let it we it, it goes so it's important to remember it now sometimes this is a next thing we're reluctant about forgiveness because we don't want to we feel like we're judging someone, especially if it's someone in our family, someone close to us. We love them so much. And here we're sort of 
it's people hate talking about their family sometimes where most of our hurts I mean you know we can choose our friends we can't choose our family and there's a reason because we're being formed in the family and if the Lord can come in there with forgiveness we can deal with anything so we're formed there we d- but we don't want to feel that we're betraying a family member it's very hard to talk about for a lot of people they won't until they have to but before god it's he will never condemn just as he's not condemned us he loves the person more than we can imagine and he understands everything sometimes um yeah, I don't know if I talked about this later, but sometimes we, let me leave that. It's reluctant. We don't need to be because we're trusting the Lord. Um, I think I've said this. Yeah, we're just, we're, we're in a way, um, okay, this is an amplification of that. It's, it's not a drama also we're reenacting against the person that we're holding them and chaining them up to look at them. It's re- to me, it's not so much the person. We're forgiving the sin. The Lord's Prayer says, forgive me as I've forgiven others. Forgive us as we forgive others. And so we do forgive the person, but it's the sin that they've committed that's significant, that did the hurting. Sometimes if we focus too much on the person, we begin to justify it. Like, well, they had a difficult background themselves. They're this and this and this. That's fine. But don't suppose that you know their motive that you understand them because sin is chaotic we can't it sometimes comes out of nowhere and hits us in the head so we we let the person go i i do think the image of going into a court as a witness who is the most significant person in the court before the judge who's the lord the person is placed you know on the defense and we just speak in the court. We speak to the Lord of the sin and its ramifications. And we leave. We go in and we leave free and clear. And the person is left in the care of God is a good way to think of that. And as we're forgiving the sin and the outrage of it that we've carried, that as we place that at the cross, it's really that outrage is placed on the body of Christ. That, that was the death of Christ. He took it. And his words are good words to think of. Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. He didn't go into detail. He didn't say they did it because they were religious or they thought they had to or they were a mob mentality. He just said, you know what, they don't know what they're doing. And we can say that about ourselves a lot of times. You know, I was so rude there. I just, I didn't even, wasn't thinking, I didn't know what I was doing. I am so sorry. And the same for people against us. Okay, I'm getting to the end. Are you still there? It's very, this is it. This is my last one on short prayer. This one is the last one today. Forgiveness is also agreeing to live with the consequences of another's sin against us. And of course, we have to live with the consequences of our own sin. Sometimes we have to go to jail. We have to make it right. Hey, I'm just getting some money from a guy I gave money to too fast to fix my kitchen. And I never saw him again. (laughs) And then couple of years later just when I was ready to really paint the kitchen and figure it out the court starts sending me the money I'm so happy they took the guy to court and it was something initiated by somebody else but I benefited from it he had taken a lot of money from a lot of people up and down Vancouver Island about 15 of us and I was included in the arrangements I'm so grateful to the people who organized it to the court who made him, and many people gave him another chance, but he didn't take it. The court did, and I'm so grateful for that in Canada, and that my money has been a nice little check each month. COVID, it was a bit slower, but I have 180 remaining. Very nice. We have consequences to sin. And 
we have to live with it when it's sin against us. I, I quote this, I know, I'm sure you've heard it before, Leanne Payne, who wrote so much on, on healing and forgiveness. I heard her and in a conference and, you know, it was her last conference. She was in her 80s. She was fabulous. And I, she said this with such glee when she was talking about sin. She said, you know, our sin causes a whole lot of pain to a whole lot of people. And she, the way she said it, she had such an understanding for the way. And if you think of a good sin today, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you think of a good one, you can see its ramifications. Whoa. And this is what overwhelms me in the middle of the night. Something I did that, you know, it affected things. And I just pray that people don't notice or remember, but it affects everybody. And we all have to live with it. We live with it in our culture, in our society, you know? So we have to be prepared to, for instance, if we've we're forgiving a sin of betrayal, adultery. We have to be prepared. We have to face up to it, to live on and heal from that experience of personal, uh, personal experience of broken trust. It's very hard. I have a little book called When Trust is Broken. And from anybody, a friend, a spouse, a parent, a community, when trust is broken, I always remember Dr. Phil was saying, when trust is broken, the person who's been sinned against, they get to go at the pace. If they're restoring it with the other person, they go. you go at their pace. So it's something that the Lord, when we forgive, healing can begin. And that is a process too, sometimes very important. If we're hit, assaulted, hit in the face, the nose is broken, our face may be disfigured, rearranged, it might be permanent. I think of Tina Fey, you know, Tina Fey, the comic? SNL, 30 Rock, she has a big, she has a big scar. I think she has a big scar on her left, I think. And I think she talked about it in an interview once. I think it was a burglary or some, some crazy thing. Just on the news, Rick Moranis, another Second City person, walking down the street of New York. Did anybody see that? You're probably not watching this stuff like I do. Just a passerby, just began bashing him on the head and he was thrown down on the cement between the building and the sidewalk in the corner. And the only thing I saw following that up was Rick Moranis thanking everybody for their good wishes. But it was shocking. The man just deranged and going on. But you have to let that go, but you have to live with it. You know, and everybody saw it. It was awful. We have to live with it. Somebody steals your money, you know, the money's gone. The money's gone. You have to live with it. So that is something. Forgiveness allows us to open up to that healing. Um, and that's, that's what the kingdom of God is. It's that zone where healing can start, things are released, and it allows us to open up God's gentleness and grace and power in forgiving us. Forgiveness brings us to God so that we sit in heaven in high places with him, in the heavenly places with him, according to Ephesians. We are with him. He is with us as we walk. It's completely different. And we can accept all these consequences as he did. Now, of course, if that kind of relationship is current and very difficult, where we're being hit or you know then that's where we have to say no we might have to remove ourselves but we do have to set boundaries i think the christian church is just you know we're so boundaryless sometimes i certainly have been and i love the subtitle of the book boundaries that says if you can't say no your yes means nothing it's a, a good little thing to say. So I'm just going to pray for us. And I hope some of the, you know, that's not an extensive, absolute 
thing, but it, those were points that I think sometimes we overlook. And um, maybe I'll just pray to close. And then if, we, if there's any discussion before we pray about other things. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that whenever and wherever you prompt us, we, we make tracks to you the way this woman sought you out, went to you, just to be near you, just to be in your presence, not even to speak, but just to be by you at the foot of your cross or with you sitting. When we realize a sin that you show us, we can decide to name it, confess it to you. And we know we're sliding home. We are, you know, what is it? Pass and go. We, we are just on our way. And when you show us a sin, we need to forgive. We know we can, we can we're able, we have the power to embrace your power to forgive the sin, its effects, the person himself, herself. And you're invited to begin our healing, our release. We know we're no longer captive. We don't care about the history of it, the regularity of it, what it was or how it was. We know that you are always whispering to us. I love that you believe the one who was sent for you, to you, from our dear father. You are my sister, my brother, because you are doing the will of God by believing me. Your sins are forgiven. Come along with me, my dearest one, and we shall continue to walk in the way of perfect peace together. For wherever I am, you shall be also. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your kindness, your goodness to us, your presence by the Holy Spirit that binds us to you, so that as you tell us, the three of you are with us, one upon another, in us and for us. And we thank you in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. <laughs>